And how are you getting on? Welcome to You're On Crack, mate. This is the new film podcast where we discuss films that have a mm, questionable uh, set of reviews from, well, everyone, really. So I'd like to introduce you to Darren Smith. Hello. Oh, I meant to talk now. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Did I emphasize this is a new podcast? It's all about making mistakes. It's fine. Absolutely. Much like our parents did 32 years ago, this is all about making some mistakes. And also, like a lot of people making these films, a lot of mistakes were made. But we'll get to that. We will indeed. Ho, ho, ho. So, before we jump into this week's film, Darren, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I didn't prepare this bit, but um, about me. Well, my main background is, as you know, music and science. I studied both um, masters and thing. But I think that the main thing about me and you is that we both love film and we talk about film all the time. I think it, the main decision to do this podcast was that we like to have a joke. We like to watch films and kind of take the piss out of them a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, we both love film. And I particularly like looking into the, the minutiae bit of film. And you do as well. Like we're constantly watching a film, going onto IMDb, looking up all the trivia, seeing why this film is such a disaster and laughing about it. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree, which I think is the main point in this. Like, Without any spoilers coming up, the film we've chosen to do today, for example, and some of the other films, you adore this film. I despise, not despise, that's too harsh a word, maybe. I don't like this film. I appreciate it for what it is. But yeah, so this is this is the reason why. Sometimes we disagree and sometimes we argue, but we're going to keep it polite and genteel for this podcast. It's not going to be a screaming match. And if it is, I'm sure that'll be a bit of fun. So I think you pretty much nailed it there um you are exactly right so the reason that we are coming together and doing this is because we love film we devour film we devour television as well tv shows without much further ado we're going to jump into this week's film which is the 2012 masterpiece cloud atlas by tom twiker and the wachowskis based on the 2004 novel of the same name by author David Mitchell. For those who don't know the story, I understand it is not the most accessible film, and I think that is where, Darren, some of your issues with the film might come, and I think the 172-minute runtime may also contribute to that, but that's fine. Today we're going to analyze why you're wrong. So, I mean, yeah, why I'm wrong. Well, we'll see. I think if you look at most reviews, I think they'll, they'll side with me. But we'll get to that. I think it's the kind of film that it's very hard sci-fi. And I think that's not accessible to everybody. And I think when you go in and you have a film which has so much going on at such a long runtime, people shut off. I think we're we're more accepting of this kind of genre because we're used to it. It's, it's our bread and butter. It's what we grew up on sci-fi. We love it. But I think when you try and do as much as they were doing, I think that's not even my main issue. My main issue is something we'll get onto later on, which is around the topic of yellow face. Um, but we'll get to that. And I think everyone knows about it. I think it's the beginning of that controversy as well. I think that's not the beginning of it, but I think certainly one of the biggest highlights in our time. But there's different things. Like, I'm not going to completely disagree with you with this. Is the whole point. It's going to be a conversation. Yeah, I think one of the things to point out as well is if you don't like this film the first time you see it, a lot of people say in the second and the third viewing, it's a lot better because you know what to expect. There's less coming at you. You kind of you can sit back and kind of enjoy it more than kind of trying to focus on everything that's going on. But my question would be at that point to you, should it, should you have to watch a film two or three times in order to get it? I think it's more accepting in a different genre. Like I, I'm more accepting of it in, in a book, for example. If someone doesn't like a book the first time they read it, it couldn't can take a second reading to enjoy. But I think film should be instant. If if it's not, if you don't get it the first time, should you have to come back to it a second and third time? But we'll get to all that. So where do you want to kick off? I think what we'll do first is we'll just we'll run through the different segments of the film. So there are 
one, two, three, four, five. There's six different timelines in this film, which broken down chronologically. We have the Pacific Islands in 1849. We have Cambridge and Edinburgh in 1936. We have San Francisco in 1973. We have London, 2012. Neo Soul, 2144, which was the beginning of some of the controversy that you were speaking of there. <clears throat> yep. And we have the Big Isle after the fall, which is set in the far future of 2321. So one thing that if you haven't seen this film, what you must understand, there is quite a small cast spread over a very large area. So we have stars like Tom Hanks, we have Halle Berry. We have Ben Whishaw, Hugo Weaving, we have Jim Broadbent, we have Jim Sturgis, uh, we have Duna Bay. Um, now, I, apologies if I've missed anyone out there. I probably have Hugh Grant, of course. Sorry, oh, Hugh yeah, Grant. Of course. But, yeah, yeah. Um, throughout the various uh, timelines, these characters, these actors, they play different characters. And the idea is that a soul travels through the different timelines and can move in different bodies, uh, different families, even. So without jumping to the end, so starting at the start, so the film opens in the Pacific Island. Here we have a somewhat ragged Tom Hanks uh, panning for gold. He meets the fairly hapless Jim Sturgis. That'll end well. We have, yes, I'm kind of jumping all over the place a little bit. And that's kind of what the film does. Yeah, oh, no, that's definitely what the film does. I think I think the problem, I think one of the main issues, the first thing you've come across without kind of talking too much about exactly what happens in the film is that already you get the sense of, okay, we have six, we'll say six core actors, because that's kind of what you have. They're each playing six roles in six different time frames and for a film and for, it is a long film but i think it's a wrong medium for this kind of a thing if you if you could spread it out for a tv show for example which of course it's not but like if you did i think it would work a lot better because you'd have you could have six hours you could have an hour for each time period and then wrap it up in a seventh hour but with this you have all these different periods it jumps in and out of different times you do see the actors and realize okay well he must be kind of in some way related to the other person he's playing back in 1800s or whatever it might be but it's just for me it was very disjointing and the far future one I mean we'll get to it but the, I I know what you're going for you're talking about the soul and the, the whole thing about love transcends time and can connect everybody throughout these hundreds and hundreds of years but then you get to the far future and you have people talking like they never learned to speak properly which of course they didn't but like when you have an amazing Oscar-winning actor saying things like this is the true true for me that it just if I was reading it, perhaps it wouldn't be as silly. And that's the best word I can use. That's what it felt like when I watched it. And I know not everyone felt like that. And I get why the dialogue is the way it is. But for me, it wasn't, it just didn't ring true enough. And I think we should put out at this point that obviously neither of us, well, I haven't read the book. Have you read the book? I have tried to read the book. Okay. So we're going into this, just so everyone knows, not having read the book. So we don't know the source, source material as well. However, what I will say is the book was written by David Mitchell, who at first thought that this film was unfilmable. There's no way you could make this into a film. It's too all over the place. Then the Wachowskis made it and he changed his mind and he thought it was great and fabulous. But of course, we have to take everything like that with a grain of salt. He might just be saying that for, the, you know what I mean? Well, what I saw, I, I think I, I think I read the same interview that you were looking at. Um, he described his book as a Russian doll. Yes. That every time you go deeper, obviously another element comes out, and he felt that that maybe wouldn't translate very well to film. Mm. He he made the point, which I think is quite universal of all film, which is that film is a different form of art. It's a different medium. There will be adaptation. There will be things that work. And there will be things that don't work. He spoke of the Wachowskis and Twiker. They they speak a different language. Their language is visual, whereas his was, you know, around the written word. It was about the structure on the page. So I think he would probably have been, before we saw the film, he was probably correct to say that it was unfilmable, mm -hmm. much like a, a certain trilogy about a golden ring was unfilmable for many years. But then somebody comes along with a vision. Yeah. In the case of Cloud Atlas, it happened quite quickly. There was eight years between... Yeah, the book was 2004, I think. Also, so it's, it's, it's Tom 
Tikfer is how you pronounce it. And we're going to get letters. That's why I'm telling you, because I have to look it up as well. And apparently the W is pronounced like a V. So it's Tikfer. Tikfer. That comes Tom, from his own. I, apo- I apologize. <laughs> I have, uh, on my first round of doing a podcast, I have already put myself to shame. <laughs> you so, to get letters, Sean. So many letters. Absolutely. Tom Tikfer, you were an excellent filmmaker. And also, nice segue, an excellent musician. Oh, okay. Let's... This, yes, he is one of the composers of the score, which to me is the best thing to come out of the film. I it's... absolutely understand. Uh, I, I would agree, but the soundtrack can stand on its own. I think the soundtrack is yeah. fantastic. Yeah, 100%. And all the research I was doing for this episode, I had that in the background. I kept stopping reading stuff just to listen because it's just, it is amazing. And you can, again, music's a different genre, but you can you can hear in the score the different the six different time periods like you can hear that it's interweaving it's going all over the place but it works like that and again yeah it's the, it's the best unlike the film i think critics were very very positive reactions to the score there wasn't yes. there wasn't that kind of mixed reaction that the film got the film got very we're talking about polarizing it it was almost 50 50 if you look at a lot of reviews it's kind of like people either hated it or loved it there was very little in between i think a lot of people obviously were very respectful like even people that didn't like it were saying it's a great vision it's i think kermode said it best he said it's the film's a failure but an honorable failure which is which is nice because they had a vision that they, they had a good intention to show the soul of this book and what it means. The idea is very cerebral ideas, but it just fell a bit flat, I think, for me. Now, actually, it's funny you should mention Kermode because his second review mm-hmm. of the film, a couple of years later, supports both of our points. He said that coming to it another time, he began to see more in it that he enjoyed. He began to, he thought it was possibly better made than it had initially come across, which Perhaps I'm just one step ahead of everyone else, and I enjoyed it first time around. But also, it goes back to what you were saying, that great, he watched it a second time, but should a film have to be watched twice to be enjoyed? I feel, without uh, delving into the internet right now, I'm sure we could probably think of other examples of uh, film or TV shows that possibly weren't that good, for want of a better word, on initial release or initial reception but you know on a revisit maybe things that might not have been presented the way they were meant to be presented become a bit more obvious now that's uh, we we can get into something more specific on that once we uh wikipedia it but well i'll i'll, uh, I'll concede that so the way i see this so what i said earlier that you should have to watch a film a second time i think that depends on the type of film i'm talking about this as being the blockbuster Hollywood film it is. I don't think you should have to watch a Hollywood film oh. twice. However, if you're watching an indie or an art house film or something like that, then that might take a few viewings. So like if you watch A Clockwork Orange for the first time, you might watch it and go, okay, what the hell? And then you watch it a second and a third time and you start to see these connections like Kermode was saying. With this film, you start to see more connections because you've had more time to process it. And when you watch it a second time, you don't have to pay as much attention to certain bits because you already know it and you keep going on. But I think this film is, it wants it to be an art house film with the ideas that it had behind it, but in a Hollywood budget. And I don't think that works as well. And you're looking like you're going to contradict me. Go on, what are you going to say? Not contradict, but it's a very interesting point, is that you are both exactly right and you are exactly wrong because this is an indie film. It is one of the most expensive independent films ever made. And it was called, in an informal way, one of the first German blockbusters. Warner Brothers distributed the film, but they injected no money into it. This was all funded by uh, various grants and uh, sourced monies by right. the Wachowskis. I, I can see that point. However, okay, so $20 million came from Warner Brothers. They, they, to be fair, they had to beg and beg and beg and beg, but they got $20 million, which when you look at the roughly 120 130 million budget, it's not that much. Which is crazy yeah. to think, but yes, sir, yeah. 20 million is really not that much in the world for, for of filmmaking. This film, no, and I think, yeah, they got the a lot from Germany, places in Europe. China had a big investment. I think overall, I think this is one of the reasons why it failed, not so much because of the input these people had, but it had at least 20 different backers in 20 different regions of the world giving money to it and that's 20 different opinions that all of these people have an equal right to give for how they think 
things should go, how they think marketing should be. And yes, Warner Brothers distributed, but yeah, which they had, but they had the big markets. They, okay, China not included, but they had like Australia, they had the UK, they had America, and. They, I think, one of the reasons why this film, regardless of whether it's good or bad, the reason it didn't make enough money like it should have was because of marketing. And I think Warner Brothers dropped the ball big time with marketing. I think that on the topic of marketing, I remember back in potentially late 2011, but certainly obviously before the film, the the trailer that dropped was six minutes long, which is sort of, uh, which is... You know, in hindsight, potentially a bit of an indication as to the film. And the film is a mega-sized film, mm-hmm. should come with a mega-sized trailer. How do you condense 172 minutes into a two-minute trailer? Now, I know there are many examples of where that has been quite successfully done. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the trailer for Cloud Atlas. I think it stands as a beautiful, tiny little short film. Yeah, but I, agree. I do agree that it doesn't potentially grab it's it, it wasn't going to put bums on seats in the way that uh, i'm trying to think of some of the best trailers of all time the dark knight the return of the king okay they kind of had an audience at that point but you know yeah, what star i mean star wars trailers i mean they star trailers, wars yeah. sorry yes force awakens yeah, yeah. uh but whereas this was probably i'm conceding a bit of ground here but it suited the idea of the small cinema with the coffee shop outside and we can have a nice chat about the film afterwards. Mm-hmm. It doesn't suit the idea of queues back around the block p- pumping money into the receipts, which is what a blockbuster kind of has to do. Thank you very much, Jaws, for setting the trend. Mm-hmm. I saw that the box office receipt for this one came in at about $130 million, which, unfortunately, because of the size of the budget means that this film came in as a failure because i, th- I think it, it, it earned just enough to say that it, it earned money that's one of the phrase but like it, it earned enough to say that okay it, it, it got some money back but so it broke even but that's not how you make it in hollywood you don't breaking even is a, is a failed film an awful shame but you're absolutely right yeah and i think the normal rule of thumb is if however much a film costs normally the same amount is spent on marketing which i don't think was the case here but at least half the budget you would say in marketing. So even at that, if you take all that in consideration, it's still lost money. And just come back to the trailer really quickly, because I find it really interesting that I think the trailer puts forth the idea and the embodiment of the film that like the soul and transcending time and love transcending time a lot better than the film does. I think a lot of the problems start with people's confusion. I think a lot of the problems start with the trailer because you have a six minute trailer, but the, the first part of that is the three different directors talking about the film as if they need to explain like and i rarely see you really have to see that it's normally a trailer you get everything about the film from the trailer but this it seemed like they needed to kind of hold the audience's hand a little bit and explain a little bit about things before the trailer kicked off which is a kind of a a pre-warning to like this is going to confuse a lot of people (laughs) what do you think Um, i see the point i i do i do see the point i uh i'm reminded of potentially more successful director trailers of mm-hmm. Hitchcock mm-hmm. but uh yeah I want, to, I want to have a better argument against that one no I, get, I, I do that. I can I do concede the point um, yeah and I get that but look this is okay I'm gonna just go through again my positives for this film because I do have some I, it's not like I think the film is awful it's has as again I said it has an honorable intention I, I like that they want to take this book that they love that has it really powerful message in it go against what everyone said this can't be made into a film and do it and they did they made it into a film i i can't contest how well they adapted it because i haven't read the book but from what people have said and from things i've seen people read and from the author himself they did a good job from a technical standpoint it is amazing like there's no yes. there's no there's no doubts it, it looks beautiful the cgi is great it, for, especially for the time i watched it recently some some doesn't hold up but like that can be forgiven it's like almost like hey what eight years ago now at this point Hmm. 2012 yeah so that's fine but for the time it looked great the costumes are great the i was going to say the makeup is great bar one part which we'll get to but other than that everything it looks great it it feels great it just i think a lot of the dialogue falls flat for me and and the the idea again it's i keep coming back to it and i know it's 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 not a silly thing it's a very big big important thing i'm thinking like yeah all the characters all the actors do a great job of portraying their different characters and then you have Neo Soul, 
which we'll get we, to. That's what get... throws me off. But go, go on. What, why we, do you like this film? We'll get. We'll get. I just say we, and we will get to Neo Soul. <laughs> where, where I think where th- that's going to get a few minutes to itself. Yes. Um, I just really, just for anyone who just isn't aware, the the way that the film was split up in terms of directing was that the Wachowskis took control of Pacific Islands, Neo Soul, and Big Isle. And Tom Thickbert looked after Cambridge, Edinburgh, San Fran, and London. So the three closest together in time. Now, they worked together as much as they could, but generally that was done separately. Mm-hmm. Generally. Mm-hmm. It, obviously, there was there was crossover. And into post-production, they, they started to work together a bit more closely. In terms of where, or where we would have been then, 2011, 2012, the Wachowskis took the most far-flung elements of the stories. So much in the past, and so much in the future. Which makes sense when you look at their catalogue. Which makes, absolutely. And that's, that's where I'm coming to with that. So, if you think of what the Wachowskis have contributed to cinema, it, it is really hard to overstate how much The Matrix changed cinema in 1999. Now, maybe not the entire film but if we were to try and do a count of the amount of films that used bullet time afterwards i think we would this would be a nine hour podcast (laughs) at least Um, and you know they do futuristic well even grounding it a little bit and i think in the far future on big isle it was this post-apocalyptic everything has kind of fallen away it's 2321 so it's 40 years before the enterprise launches and a lot has got to change in those 40 years <laughs> but what's really evident is that the earth is just a ruin i don't have as much of a problem with the dialogue because i feel while we didn't see what happened between neo soul and between the big isle feel that if there is enough of a breakdown in society and that's several generations you know we've seen you know the bible mark 52 is you know available at the moment it's probably nothing like it was written back in the day so language i think can change over time i i i hear what you're saying and when you're in i think you you really you really made a great point when you said in one film it's quite hard to jump between all of these different speech patterns all of these different styles whereas if it was possibly a mini series perhaps that's us being spoiled for choice that we've seen long form storytelling done very successfully whereas maybe in 2012 this is this is what they had on offer perhaps it would have worked better as a miniseries bringing it back a little bit you have this broken society of nothing really left we have this new new slash old speech pattern i think where it struggles a little bit is with the, the Halle berry's character in the future which is completely futuristic we have off-world kind of colonization has the same speech patterns as tom hanks character in the future that for me stood out a little bit more than say tom hanks having that speech pattern i think i would have been more acceptable if they had different because it would make sense if if she's in a more futuristic off-world obviously the part of society that advanced had more recognizable english or any language like a more structured language and then his was a bit devolved that would make more sense but the fact they both have it doesn't really make sense and i know yeah i get your point and i i i I do understand that in the future language might change language has changed over the last not even talking about 100 years the last 10 20 30 years there's always new words coming in and ball yeah and even i'm even thinking of mad max mad max is they're speaking english but there's still a lot of words that are slang and slang that doesn't exist that were made up by by Miller for the film. But again, it's just it's Tom Hanks saying those words, and it's 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 a personal thing. I know it's a personal thing. I, I, some of the people I know do take the mick out of it. I mean, there's a whole episode of Rick and Morty where Jerry kept saying the <laughs> truth. Do you know what I mean? And that kind of thing. So people do, other people are do think that bit is silly. But again, that's not the main thing that I don't like about the film. But it was it was it was you're right. It's the jarring between the two. I think it would be a lot make more sense if you had one society of one part of humanity that spoke a bit better in or want of a better word <laughs> or spoke a more structured english or language and then have a more devolved language then that might make more sense yes <laughs> <laughs> right so that yes yeah, so that. that's that's big isle i think just i think what we'll do is we'll, we'll we'll quickly go through the different sections so big isle i think it's very very ambitious mm-hmm. um i do like the change i think it's 
We've never seen Hugh Grant as unique as we have seen him in that section. But uh, yeah. yes, I, I see. Now, going all the way back to the start, Pacific Islands, I, do, I have to say, I love the kind of rough and tumble Tom Hanks in that one. I, no, I do. I love that. I have to say, I do love that. And it, I think, if anything, this film shows off his, his range, like what he can do, mm. why he is the great actor and Oscar winner that we love. Because he, 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 and it's a, it's a funny role. He's meant to be comedic in it and he pulls it off brilliantly, I think. Yes. I think yeah. it, 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 the makeup might be a bit over exaggerated. That's the one I'm thinking of with the teeth. Fake too, but it's he does it great. He does it brilliantly. I have to say, I agree. I think I remember on first watching, on first watching a lot of this film. What I loved it. There was a lot of what <laughs> moments going on as I was watching. I, I I enjoyed my incredulity. We will get back to Jim Sturgis. Mm-hmm. He is in that section. It's a rather large role in that section. We'll come back to him. To be honest, my favourite section is Cambridge Edinburgh, uh, Frobisher composing the the sextet. Oh, that's that's mine as well, and I think that's I think that's a very personal choice for both of us because we we love music so much. But I think it is still just it's, yeah, it's it's my favorite bit. I think between it's for of the sections of the film, it's between that one and Louisa Ray in San Francisco because of all of the different segments, they are the most human. I suppose they're the most grounded in that. Obviously, never mind the 2012 segment. There's there's not a lot going on in terms of you know fantastical technology. There's, yeah. uh, and we have obviously moved so far forward from the time of Adam Ewing. It's just easier to sort of get lost in in, in those. Most, it's the most familiar, I think, and not just to us, but I think to, to a wider audience. It's it's the most it's the most familiar to them, and I think people that have talked in reviews online. People would like those sections as well because they're so familiar to them. Yes, and anyone they're accessible to anybody. Like you don't need to be like us Trekkies, sci-fi fans going in because the the future stuff. I know a lot of people that were put off by the future because it was too unfamiliar. It's not the type mm. of film they watch because, as well as this film being six different timelines, it's six different genres in a way. If you look at it that way, like you have a period, yep. two period pieces. You've got a kind of San Francisco y kind of detective y ish kind of reporter, but that kind of section is different again, detective kind of thing. Then you've got like, yeah, do you know what I mean? And then you've got like your your proper sci fi, like your Blade Runner world. And then you've got something complete in the future, like Mad Maxian kind of thing way out there, which can throw a lot of people off. And it's the section in the middle that's most familiar to people, I think, is why they like it the most, because it's not as out there. It's just, it's the reporter and starting off into the cab. And I think, I think just. Just really, really quickly uh, agreeing with everything you said. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I lo- the the love story is heartbreaking. Cambridge Edinburgh between Frobisher and Six Smith. James Darcy is the only actor to play the same character in two segments. That ends well. It's tragic. It, it's a tragedy. It's maybe the great tragedy of the film. There yeah, are I certainly so. other tragic moments, and we are getting ever closer to some of those other tragic moments. But I think it is it is handled very very well, mm-hmm. and. What's slightly ludicrous, I suppose, you know, seeing uh, some of the same actors in as different characters, that's toned down a little bit in Frobisher's time and in Louisa Ray's time. Yes. Um, whereas, as you said, in Adam Ewing's time, Tom Hanks with his lovely teeth, and then in, obviously, Neo Soul and in The Big Isle, we have, well, in The Big Isle, we have Hugh Grant as a tribal leader. Um, mm-hmm. Not that I don't believe Hugh Grant could be a tribal leader. It's just quite jarring to see. No, um, I, I think one of the things, just while you mentioned about toning down of the makeup and stuff like that and the prosthetics and stuff, I think it's difficult for an audience to accept. I think it's for me anyway, it's diff- difficult for me to accept these six different actors. Again, we have the six core actors. We'll, we'll stick mm-hmm. to that. And the six different time periods. The fact that they're all playing different characters who look different, there's only so much you can do with making pr- makeup and prosthetics before it looks a bit silly. It, it just... It's a bit jarring, whereas if you had, I don't know, different actors playing those different roles, but they all had the same surname, like, I think it wouldn't be as, you know, rather than trying to force Tom Hanks into a role with crazy hair and teeth. But I think that works. I I think it's funny, but then you have other issues then where it can be a bit, they look the same, but you're just hiding it with a bit of makeup or, like, implants, in the case of Halle Berry with her, kind of, the implant thing she has in her head, which Mm. I don't, like, actually, no, I can't remember what that's for in the film. It's probably for something. But, do you know what I mean? It, It can be a bit jarring, I think, for audience to see the same people play different characters. But there's there's probably loads of examples out there of where it has worked. I'm sure there is. And 
If anyone can think of them, please let me know, and we might have future episodes. <laughs> My least favourite segment is London 2012. I love Jim Broadbent. I think he's a wonderful actor. I just think the segment, it just lacks excitement, whereas all of the rest have some form of excitement, even in the tragic love story of mm -hmm. Frobisher. You know, will he survive or won't he? Uh, Louisa Ray is probably the most exciting. Um, the mystery thriller Adam Ewing, is he going to live, is he going to die Neo Soul, very exciting a lot of sci-fi going on, a lot of action Big Oil, probably the scariest part of the film with, with the tribe um, and then in, in 2012, what, what's the threat he's locked in a care home yeah, I, I, get, I get that, it is a bit I, I think that it dips a little bit I think for a lot of people in that kind of section, there's no, there's not much going on, like you said, and it's, it's. I'm actually struggling now to remember a lot of it because it, there, there is so little going on that it's the least memorable part of the film, in my it's, opinion. Um, it's, it's not awful. I mean, no, no, no. In my not, opinion, no. no part of the film is awful, but no. it, it certainly pulls the pacing down mm -hmm. a little bit. And in a film that's 172 minutes long, you don't want something to throw off your pacing. No, you don't want anything to slow it down at all. It needs no. to feel quick. That's one thing I would say as well. I, it felt, I don't know about you, but I say the people that have enjoyed this film, and like, like us when we watch certain films that are three hours long or two hours plus, we enjoy them so it's, it seems quick. Whereas when, yes. when I watched this, I felt every minute of those two hours and 52 minutes for most of it. I kind of came out and went, that was a long film. That is Not a slightly damning it. review. That's a... Uh... Well, look, let's let's get on to more positive things. So before we move on to You're the, right. the, the You're big right. reason why I don't like this film, <laughs> the issues with it, and other than that, but the other things are, okay, so the great things to come out of this film is the soundtrack, which we've talked about. Of course. Fantastic. Yeah. Just the fact that got this made, again, this is kind of separate to the film being good or bad, but the fact that the Wachowskis, that Lana and Lily got this made is phenomenal. And I think possibly set the trend for a lot of people a lot of directors thinking i don't need a big hollywood not necessarily the budget but i don't need the backing of them to a big hollywood studio to do the films that i want to do yes you have a lot you 20 million from warner brothers but did they stick their hand in as much as they would have if, if they backed the entire film no would this be a completely different film if they said yeah we'll pay roll it here's 120 million dollars completely different film because, again, one of the reasons that I'm astounded that this got made is that, yes, we had The Matrix, phenomenal film. We had the follow-up, their films. They didn't do as well as The Matrix, but people still went to see them because it was this massive franchise. Then you had Speed Racer. I think that's the main reason why Warner Brothers didn't jump and say, which has he's take our money, make a new film. Because Speed Racer is the same. It made more money than Cloud Atlas, but, I mean, it just about broke even. It wasn't a huge success. Did, I, I just don't know the year, did Jupiter Ascending come before or after? After. Oh dear. Which again, as much as I love the Wachowskis, I think in my mind, the two best things they have done is The Matrix and then Sense8, which is a TV show, which is completely different, but they, they are agree. both fantastic. And I, I can see why Warner Bros. didn't back them, which makes me even more amazed and kind of, it's an honourable thing that they got this, they, they went to 20, 20 different studios. I don't, not studios, but 20 different backers financially. I'm struggling to think of a film, and again, there probably isn't that has that many investors, that it's not all just from the one main studio. Well, cer certainly a film of that size. Yeah, oh um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smaller like, indie films, yes, of course, yeah, but like a film of this, this is, this is a Hollywood blockbuster film. It's a regrettable thing that this highly ambitious big budget blockbuster film uh, albeit based on a novel original blockbuster not a sequel not part of a franchise mm -hmm. it's a shame it didn't find the audience that potentially it deserved or to be fair possibly it got exactly what it deserved i don't know uh but if you think of think of the last think of the years since cloud atlas and think of the big summer blockbusters that haven't been either sequels, part of franchises, or DC or Marvel. I'm now struggling to think of one that was completely on its own. Completely, because there was obviously Independence Day Resurgence, but even that was a sequel. I think the only thing I can think of that did really well, but again, it's probably not a fair thing to say because it's based on something. Jumanji did extraordinarily well, but that was for different reasons. Yes, it reasons. did, actually. It's the, it's the power, it's, it was the actors you had in it. Uh, but Ebert, who... Now, again, this always confuses me because I know he passed away a while ago, so whenever someone puts a review by Ebert, is it him or is it not him? 
this one was him. It was him, wasn't it? And it got four to five he stars. Has since passed away, yes. Yeah, four to five stars. I mean, that's that's a praise in itself. Who, who, if you look at some of the films he has reviewed when he reviewed them, I don't agree with a lot of them. Um, and he's very harsh in some films that are widely seen as very good. Or the fact that he got four to five stars is good. That's high praise enough. The author loved the the author of the original book loved the film. That's again huge praise. This next one that I have down of of, of kind of positive things around this film that. I always take with a grain of salt when these kind of things are mentioned in the media because to me it's just a publicity thing. But a 10 minute standing ovation at the Toronto Film Festival. That I would love to attend one of those festivals. How do people keep it going? No, it's, that's. Is my it thing. like a Mexican wave? <laughs> I think it's 30 seconds of people clapping and then nine and a half minutes of people standing around, still standing but talking to each other, and that's still counted as part of the standing ovation because the only thing I can think of. It's like when, you're at, when, you, when a concert finishes, people clap for maybe a minute, two minutes. There's still noise because people are talking and people yeah. probably say, oh, that's still part of it. Everyone loves it. No, a 10 minutes standing ovation. Well, what happens if it's somebody no. clapping going, oh, it's all right, I guess? Yeah, I, I think that's, you can take that with a pinch of salt whenever these kind of things come. I mean, like recent examples, 10 minutes standing ovation for the Joker. It was fine. 10 minutes standing ovation for Batman v Superman and Justice League. That was a complete lie. So I, <laughs> yeah, but I, I know it's a marketing thing, but most of the positive things, because like, I think that's where it premiered was at the Toronto Film Festival. It was huge waves of positivity coming out of that. And I don't know how much of that you can take it of being, can appreciate this type of film more because they're in the business or yeah. is it all just um, promotion? Is it just a not a lie, but a kind of a? I think I think it might be more to do with, say, the critic reaction because y- you're right. I think a lot of a lot of the buzz coming out of the film festivals was very positive. Occasionally, suppose increasingly these days, you see films where, say, the critic review is really really high, but the audience review might not reflect that at all. Vice versa, you mm-hmm. might see a critic review has something down down in the dregs. But the audience really loves it. It's where does wh- where do you meet that in the middle? In your head, if you see, oh, it got a 10 minute standing ovation at Toronto, dial your expectations down. Or do you come at it with critics are saying this is really quite poor? Uh, maybe it's not as bad as it seems then. Yeah, and I, I think I don't know about then, but now I know that I don't look at reviews anymore because there is, I think, for a lot of films, and a lot of the films that we would enjoy a lot, there's a huge disconnect between what the re- we love reviewers. That's, that's what I meant to say. Podcasters are different. Film reviewers I'm talking about. No, look, there is there is a huge disconnect between film reviewers and audiences. I'm going to be brave enough. I'm going to say it. But this podcast, this is a safe space, Sean. But there's a huge disconnect between, I think, what, what reviewers, what rating they give or how they feel about a film to what an audience gives. And of course, there will be a lot of audience that will agree with them. Like, I agree with a lot of stuff. It's, Kermode is my, my go-to. Go. Yeah. Um, and I agree 99% of the time I agree with him. But a lot of times I don't because I think he's very forgiving. He's very, when he goes into a film, unlike some, um, I won't mention that reviews for an Irish newspaper who I won't also name. I, anyone from outside of Ireland will not get that reference. Anyone inside of Ireland will understand who we are talking about. And I don't care if we piss him off. But Commode is kind of, he knows what film he's going into. He knows what audience it is. And he, re- he adjusts his review and his expectations and his thoughts of it to meet that point. Whereas I think other reviewers go in and think it should all be the top sandwich it should all be your citizen canes and stuff like that but i i think so i think i don't think every film criteria should be the same i don't think that trolls should be judged in the same way that you judge citizen kane no and that's fine i i mean no disrespect to either film um i think you know something is maybe made for a specific audience then you know potentially judge it against other films made for that audience I don't think people knew how to review this. Well, I think you said it very well. Which genre is it? I would call it a sci-fi genre. I would. Looking at the whole thing, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I would understand if somebody would struggle to call it pure sci-fi because (laughs) of, say, the 2012 element, because of the Louisa Ray element, and because of the Frobisher element. But if you take into the the idea of a soul passing through, idea of a soul, is it a religious film? Mm -hmm. You know, in our next section that we go on to, we see the beginnings of a religion. You know, mm-hmm. it is, in a, in a way, the if not the story of Christ, then potentially the story of Moses that could be yeah, looked yeah, at yeah. in that way. So, without further ado, Darren, talk to me about Neo Soul. If I, I honestly, honestly believe if, if you either took this, no, okay, you can't take this segment out, but if you had recast it and cast it with appropriate actors i would have liked the film way more i just have a huge issue with 
people doing what is essentially called yellow face and that's just that's not accept and i think at the time again it, it, by no means is this the first time to do this like there's there's a huge list of people that have done this i mean sean connery's done it marlon brando's done it mickey rooney's done it rob schneider's done it loads of people have done this putting on asian makeup to make themselves appear more or appear asian by and normally what they do is a very kind of stereotypical haircut that no one probably ever had in anywhere in asia and then you give them the epicanthic folds which are like kind of around the eyes and that's all you do and then they talk funny the biggest example and it was cringy when we watched it but one of the most recent things that i've seen of someone doing this back in the early 60s was we watched breakfast at tiffany's it's it's mind-boggling it's painful think that even at the time i mean y- yeah. y- you hear that excuse an awful lot of for its time for its time for its time even for its time yes it's mind-boggling yeah that, that got through it's yeah. not funny it is farce to the point where you are not laughing at the character you are laughing at the film for thinking mm-hmm. they can get away with this and, and it's if, not if, sorry you know it's, it's not it's one of those things as well that should certainly not be acceptable in this day and age and it shocks me that it was even acceptable up until the 80s and it, up that i mean like Linda Hunt won an Oscar in 82 for portraying a Chinese man. An Oscar for, for portraying someone... For, first of all, she played a different gender. That That's totally fine if that's what you want to... And she did it really... Well, I don't want to say really well. That's a bad thing to say. But portraying a different sex is one thing. That's fine. But portraying a different different race like that is just not... And the fact that it, it, it seemed to be... like Giving someone an Oscar for that is like the Academy Awards and all of Hollywood saying... This is fine. You can do this. It's totally no problems. But in this film, and in this time it was made, and especially nowadays, no, I can't. I can. I can look past it in older, to an extent, in older films, or at least not look past it. I'll, I'll ignore it and try and enjoy the rest of the film as it is. Like Breakfast at Tiffany's, I enjoy that film. It's a good film. I just cringe every time Mickey Rooney comes on screen. But in Cloud Atlas, to me, it's not acceptable. To me, it's like. And the, the, it, I wasn't the only one. There's huge controversy at the time of, of people saying you can't do this. And the only thing that seemed to make them more Asian was the eyes. That's all they put makeup around the eyes. There you go, bang, Asian. I think it's yeah, the idea of the plot. Mm-hmm. I I totally understand it. Yes, no, no, you yeah. know, plot wise, yeah, yeah. You have family lines. I don't think it's cancel culture to say that it's not okay. I, mm-hmm. d- I don't think it's an overreaction. I don't particularly think there was any malice in it. Um, I think it was just, it was written this way. It would be Jim Sturgis in these different timelines and Jim Sturgis's family mixed with an Asian family and they became interwoven. And so you have Jim Sturgis in yellow face. And even saying the words out loud, it's... You know, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And it's something that, going all the way back to start, something that potentially works in a book because you're not, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's not yellow face or black face or white face if you are describing a character. Yeah, movie. because you don't, have a, you don't have an actual person. Exactly. Yeah. Now, potentially opening up the ground for debate here, <laughs> why is it acceptable in a book and not acceptable in a film? I think I think first of all you need to, we need to distinguish between this isn't what I would necessarily term especially in Hollywood terms whitewashing because to me that's where you change completely a character so that's where you have a, an Asian character and you sorry go, I agree not, with that yeah, you're not Asian anymore you're you're now a white person I mean the things that spring to mind are you have Tilda Swinton in the Marvel universe playing a Tibetan monk and then you have Scarlett Johansson playing the major who is from a Japanese manga and anime and she's clearly as white as white can be in this in this universe that's clearly Japanese inspired that's whitewashing that's where you take a character that was meant to be of a, from a specific nation of the world and you just make them white this is worse by a long shot because you're not only taking the role away from an Asian or American Asian actor you are whitewashing it and then putting makeup on that person to make them look like someone different or from a different part of the world so would you argue that perhaps instead of casting jim sturgis as his uh, descendant should they have potentially done a casting call in korea and found someone who looks like jim sturgis 
Yes, because, you, because I can guarantee there is. I mean, how many, how many, how often do we look on the internet and see people's doppelgangers, and they might be from like different parts of the world, but you can still see something in them where they look like someone else. Yeah, why, why not? Why wouldn't you? How audiences would have reacted to that? Would that have been a bit of a? So again, that, then you have the issue of would that have worked in the film as well? Because then you, are people yeah. meant to jo- connect and say, is that meant to be his character? Unless you have a similar name, his he's referenced or the surname's the same. I, I don't know. Would it, would it have been better if it was just Jim Sturges without makeup on? Probably not, because then you're whitewashing. You're clearly in this futuristic Asian world. And you can't, because the book is written the way it is, the question then to me is, well, could we have made it a futuristic world, but not have it in Seoul? But no, you have to, because it's the whole essence of the film, that everything mixes together, that we're all one, the soul kind of thing travels on. Doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. It's can still be that person so you can't do that either it's tricky it, it's and, it, and, and i don't blame them for what they did i can't be annoyed with what they did because they probably had the exact same talk that we're having now can will should we do it this way how can we do it best well there's no real correct way because we're going to get someone's going to have a problem no matter what we do i don't think it's necessary their fault again yeah you're completely correct i don't think they had any malice in it whatsoever i i I, tr- I truly don't believe that i think that the story called for it maybe maybe not in so many words but the story called for this one soul moving through you know different times uh, different parts of the world unfortunately it the execution of that when you actually see that done it's a, it's a I want I want to say that is is fine it's not problematic but it is because if this yeah. was and not in any way to say that one is better or worse than the other but if this was a conversation about blackface there would be no conversation that's the big thing and that that's one of my main issues with it as well if you if you put a white person and made them look like an african american or someone from africa or even if you have someone actually no you know what it, it, it's the thing that yeah if we blackface there'd be no question about it when people do brown face like making people look like they're from india that's not acceptable it's not okay but it's still it should be as bad as someone doing blackface and yeah. i can't think of any examples since this film where people have made people look asian or of a different from a different nationality mm, not since this film no. now um, there may be uh, examples out there, maybe uh, potentially just films we haven't seen, but yeah, yeah, of I course. think potentially, um, possibly rightly because of some of the backlash that uh, this film faced. Mm-hmm. Um, I think as well, and again, not to not to downplay the seriousness of the topic, but I think some of the film got just so wrapped up in this controversy that that can't have really helped the film either. The, no, 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 definitely not, no. You know, the actual, ironically, the story set in Neo Sol is one of the most beautiful stories in the film. The oh, yeah, Son, great. Son yeah. Me 451. I mean, it's a stunning, very sad, very powerful uh, story. Again, up there for me was Frobisher for the most moving story. And yet it is impossible to have a conversation about that section of the film and not talk about the fact that Jin Sturgis has been altered through the use of prosthetics mm-hmm. to look as though he's of Asian descent as is Hugo Weaving. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to, because what you said kind of ties me back to the start of this, where we talk about one of the positive things about this film is that David Mitchell, the author of the book, came out and said that he loved it, it was great, and it, but his original thoughts were, this is unfilmable. I'm now thinking that the problem with making this into a film wasn't so much the doll inside a doll inside a doll, the Russian doll thing. It was this particular part of the book where if you didn't make this film, it is totally fine in the book because you're not actually taking jobs from people. You're not actually having a person physically look different to what they are. It's not because in the book, it's the same soul, but a different person. So they don't have to look the same. You know what I'm I'm getting at? That is very true. Whereas in the film, they do like for example we could take me and you we could sit we could put you 200 years in the future we could be have the same soul but we could look completely different we don't we don't have to look exactly the same and no one does but when you do this in a film because it's the same actor inevitably they're going to look the same you're going to be able to say yeah you look like you but they're ancestors of these people like you Mm. i look a bit like my dad you look a bit like your mom and your dad but you don't look identical to them exactly and you know you are right we see in so many films so many tv projects this idea of you know the reincarnation, the descendant, um, Bram Stoker's Dracula uh, mm-hmm. jumps to mind, uh, Winona Ryder's characters, and that's fine. That works in a visual medium, but in that example I just mentioned, it's just Winona Ryder. 
you know, yeah. so there's no there's no change. Whereas as this, I look, I get what they were trying to do. Uh, I don't think there was any malice in it. If there was ever a sequel to Cloud Atlas, I really, really, really wouldn't like them see see them do it again. I don't, and I don't think they would. Yeah. I think I think I think that's. I think this film kind of made it so that no one's going to be stupid enough to attempt this kind of thing again because it's just it's just an easy it's 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 hard to watch it's hard to look at like again when you watch these old things like in my head I remember watching Sean Connery and I forgot about that scene where in James Bond where he is he's dressed up to look like an Asian man and then I watched it again recently I'm like oh this is really painful and horrible to watch but it hasn't the thing that it is although it hasn't stopped the whitewashing con- whitewashing controversy because like you said maybe the film suffered maybe more people would have gone to see it if it didn't have this controversy surrounding because this controversy came out in 2011 before the film because obviously casting would have come out and people would have known the story and this is what's going to have to be done and I think it that similar to that whitewashing has made other films lose a lot of money because a lot of people have boycotted it and stuff like that um like ghost in the shell is okay it's not it's not an amazing film but perhaps more people would have gone to see it if there wasn't the controversy controversy behind it of course if you're looking at it from hollywood's point of view if you didn't have a big name behind it would people have gone to see it that's a whole other kettle of fish which we won't get into <laughs> not not right now only that it's it's an excellent theme to explore, but for now. So I think what we will do now is we've covered... It's impossible to cover the plot of this film. No. Just watch the film. But we've covered some of the production issues, some of the reception justified, and things we might or may may, may agree with, may not agree with, some things that are just universal. Yeah. Final thoughts. Cloud Atlas, take it away. Right, let's wrap it up. Okay. Um, again, yeah, I like... This is, this, is, this is a conversation. This is not us saying this is the best film, the worst film in the world. We're not always going to agree or disagree. This is just what we thought of it and some of the issues behind it. Final thoughts for me. You know what? I, I remember when I first watched this, I text you, I'm watching it, and you're like, oh, great. Then I text you almost three hours later and said, that was absolutely horrendous. And you were actually genuinely really upset by that because you were really hoping was. I loved it. Then I, it le- I let it settle a bit and I realized it's, it's not as bad as I originally thought. By no means. There's still that section that just throws the whole thing off for me. Initially, I said I will never watch it again. Now, you know what? I think I will, just to see. I think if I watch it again, I think we might. I might get something else from it. I think I might see things differently because I know, I know what to accept. I know the kind of the silliness that's in it, and I know when it happened. Um, is it the best movie in the world ever? No. Would I recommend it to somebody? I don't know. I honestly can't say if I would or not. I think I would, but with a caveat, and that caveat would be: sit back, relax, enjoy. I've actually, I've just thought of another film that is that length of time, um, and I watched it all in the one go, um, The Irishman. Oh, yeah. And the reason I bring it up is because it's it's not a, it's not a complete mess, but it's the same length of thing. You have to sit back and just go for it. I would, and, lo- I, and because I've known a lot of people that said they'll never watch that film again, The Irishman, because it's so long. I, I don't know if this is an endorsement for the film, but I would sooner watch Cloud Atlas for a second time than I would go back to The Irishman, and The Irishman has gotten much better reviews than Cloud Atlas. And I think that's, that for me that's praise for this film <laughs> that i would go back and watch because it, it does have much nicer things and it's a it's a it is a beautiful film to watch i would watch it again just for the soundtrack alone see the, the images go with because the soundtrack one thing we didn't talk about the soundtrack helps the audience as well it, it kind of holds their hand a bit and i like that i, I like it's what that's what a soundtrack should be so yeah not the worst film not what i originally thought it was i like it a bit better than i initially would have texted you and told you this is rubbish and yeah, I would watch it again because I would like to do what Kermode did and go back to it. So yeah, that was that, that's how I feel about it. So what, what's your what's your takeaway? What's your final thoughts? I think so. Um, I mean, I like it. I, I, I like the film. Uh, it's been it's been now a few years since I've watched it through both times. Uh, sorry, I've seen it. I've seen it twice. I've seen it once on my own and once with somebody else. And I I will say I enjoyed it far more when I watched it on my own. Mm-hmm. It's it's a hard film, I think to share in it's it's not a popcorn film it's not sit down with a group of mates and what we stick on oh cloud atlas you know (laughs) it's it's not that kind of film however it's not meant to be it's a film that's clearly made with love Mm -hmm. um a a lot of time thought a lot of planning and unfortunately you know some of the decisions that went into the film i don't think benefited the film Mm -hmm. but as we've as we've talked about a lot, I I think once you've committed to make this film, you either you go one road or you go another. They went one road. I 
I, I think we can agree that I don't, I don't think it was the right road. But for me, I suppose I can look past that because because I, uh, I have in every moment that I see that scene, and it does sort of come down to that segment at the end of the day because the rest are less problematic. I know there's other elements throughout the film which do obviously stand out a little bit. Duna Bay, for example, is in whiteface in uh, the Pacific Isle story. I think just knowing it was made with good intentions helps that a little bit. I, I, I don't think it was made with the thought of taking the part from somebody else. Now, to be straight, I'm not justifying this. I'm not saying that this is, as long as you have good intentions, this is how you should make films. I'm not saying that. I don't think it should be done again going forward, nor am I subscribing to just this once. Okay, I don't think that's a winnable argument. <laughs> I enjoyed the film. I think it's very, very well made. I think it is, it's very, very close. In my opinion, I think it was something of a testing ground for Sense8. I think this idea of the shared soul, I think that they they maybe took that idea and they brought it to Sense8. I think Sense8 is one of yeah. the most original and fantastic shows of the last decade. I think... If whoever's listening to this, if you haven't seen Sense Eight, it's it's all on Netflix. Go and watch it. It's incredible. It's it's another one where if you ask me to tell you the plot, I mean I could try, but, but it doesn't suffer because it's, it's a TV. Exactly, yeah, it's a it TV. Suffer, it has yeah. the time to do that. Yeah. So my final thoughts on that: I believe it's a film that deserves to be seen. Um, That's a question I was going to ask. Do you think everyone should? Is this a film that everyone should watch once, just to say they've seen it and make up their own minds, or would you not recommend it to somebody? I would recommend people watch us. I okay. think I think I, I do agree with what you said. I think there should be a caveat. I think for, for all of what I've said about good intentions, for all of what I've said about I see how the plot can call for that, it's a film that uses yellow face in the 2010s. It's mm. it's very, very hard to argue any any other point on that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think my 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 elevator pitch for the end is Cloud Atlas. It's a very good film. It's a very long film. It is a problematic film, but I do believe it deserves to be seen. Yeah, and I will say, go and watch Sense8 instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, on that topic, uh, Darren, thank you very, very much for joining me this evening um, on what I know is a beautiful evening outside. So thank you for giving up a couple of hours of sunshine to talk to me about film. Uh, where can people find you if they want to talk to you? Uh, they can find me at DarrenS360 on Twitter and Instagram. Lovely. So I have been Sean. You can find me at Sean Ferrick on Twitter and also Instagram because we like to keep things simple. Thanks very much for dropping by and we will talk to you again soon.